I was born in Bombay, now known as Mumbai, uh, in 1934. And I was deeply influenced by the fact that um, the, Guj the people from the state of Gujarat, because the whole state bifurcated into Gujarat and Maharashtra once you know, we got independence and people, states were reorganized along linguistic lines. It used to be a common, it used to be known as the Bombay Presidency, uh, and was split into two. And I was part of the Gujarat faction. Uh, and Gujaratis actually are traditionally uh, uh, very much oriented towards business. Uh, the, they're the ones who went all over into Africa and all over the world. They're the biggest <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> community of Indians ab uh, abroad. One thing <clears throat> which the Gujaratis have on top of that is a very powerful tradition of social work. And Gandhi, the great Gandhi, was himself a Gujarati. And he built on <clears throat> that tradition. He didn't invent it. Uh, so he, what he did was to essentially harness this for social good in a very big way. So every family virtually uh, is involved. And I came from a legal family. But my father you know, fought for independence. Mm -hmm. My eldest brother became the chief justice of India and set up the entire legal assistance, uh, legal aid program, and also public interest litigation. So there have been bridges built after, you know, uh, for him, and villages named after him because he was a great radical force for the. But this ran in the family. The reason why I got interested in economics uh, was because when I started studying economics, I realized it was a, unlike law, which my parents wanted me to get into. At that time, law was not seen the way it is today as, as, as something where you can do public interest litigation, you can do pro bono work. It was just supposed to be, you know, X versus Y, <laughs> you know, Regina versus Brown, and you know, just case law, and nothing really interesting. But I could see my teachers in Cambridge, England, were the ones where, where I first started doing economics seriously at the age of 19. That is where they were all oriented towards social work. So one could see economics not just as a bunch of chess problems or mathematical problems, which sometimes some people do, um, but it's simply an, an instrument for bringing about an uplift of people. And, and coming from India and with this background, I, I was just a patsy for it. It, it became my vocation. My fa father came from a very poor family. Uh, his own father was a primary school teacher, so my father was went through on charity and then scholarships entirely all the way. So it was a high degree of social mobility. But they were all in that generation, my you know, my parents, I'm 73 now almost. Uh, and I'm talking about something like uh, 110 years ago in India. And they were all uh, very puritanical. Uh, they, I mean, the kind of upbringing I had which was, to, you know, for all the seven sons that my father had, plus three cousins who were just <laughs> growing up with us. So he was bringing up 10 children uh, in the family. And there was no luxury, no comfort, nothing. Uh, we, we didn't get any money. There was no way of raising, earning money in those days like American kids do. So the only money that you got was from your parents. And we didn't get any. You know, we weren't allowed to go to restaurants, meaning there was no money for restaurants, money for about two movies a year. Uh, and we had, we were, I didn't wear a long pant, it was always short pants until, until I left for Cambridge, England at the age of 19. Uh, we always used the buses, no taxes, no cars and so on. But at the local bookstore, there was an open account. And I, you know, each of us read skillions of books. Um, and education was number one priority. And that really, uh, whenever I get an honorary degree, or you know, I, I always tell the kids, you know, you've got to thank your parents because without that you wouldn't be here now because they gave you the values and in many cases they also gave you the money to be able to do your education. So that, that really cut across. So, so one brother became the Chief Justice of India, another, you know, the President of the International Pediatric Neurological Society. My younger brother became uh, President of the World Foundry Association because he's a PhD in metallurgy and so on. And I've 
I'm not a slouch in economics. <laughs> that's four out of seven. And that's a pretty high ratio. But it was entirely due to this values which we had. And I think it's also stood us all in good stead because we were, like my neurosurgeon brother, who is really one of India's leading neurosurgeons, he could have settled down in Chicago where he did his basic work. And he went home. And today he does uh, neurosurgery on people, you know, uh, Poor people, no cost, no charge. And he charges, of course, he, he, the rich people. But that is, that's sort of built into our system. So even when I do something like free trade and people say, oh gosh, you've got to be a devil with horns if you believe in free trade. I said, look, just hold back. <laughs> because I, I like free trade, not because I'm, I, I'm into corporate interests and so on. Uh, corporate, corporate interests are into what I believe is the other way around. <laughs> and I want to do it because I think it's, it's going to lead to uh, growing prosperity and it's going to draw people into, uh, into more prosperity. And, and, but it's not to say that's the only way to do it. Mean, frequently you will have to supplement it uh, with other policies. So, but it is a principal instrument for at least the developing countries.